picking colors and figuring out how we're going to paint this property. And, you know, took me a long time to, to figure out. I ended up having a lot of different contractors come out to the property. And I was looking at it very much as a relationship business. And I wanted to be very uh, careful on who I selected. As an operator, I know other investors are romanticizing multifamily investing, and I'm looking to learn from other investors' mistakes. I know you are too, and you found the right place. Welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Multifamily Missteps. I'm your host, Jerome, and I've got the pleasure of having Darren Batchelder with me today. (laughs) Tell me I got it right. You got it right, my friend. Ah, I'm like eight for eight on these things. I usually try to skip over them, but I actually listen to Darren's podcast, so I've heard him say his name a few times, so I got this one right today. Darren, how are things down in Texas. Fantastic. Well, Jerome, I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, It's an honor to be here. And uh, yeah, you didn't even ask me. Most people will ask before we start the recording, how do you pronounce it? But you didn't even ask me. You just went right in and nailed it. So it's good for you, man. Yeah, it's because I've been cyber stalking you, man. Here we go. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. So you know, I, we've been running in circles. I see you on LinkedIn posting all the amazing content from your podcast. Tell listeners a little bit about your podcast and then like how you got into the multifamily investing space. Um, sure. So I have a podcast um, like yourself um, to help educate other people on on how to get involved with multifamily. Um, I pr- predominantly have a lot of syndicators come on and, and tell their stories on how they got involved, how they scaled the business, et cetera. Um, very unique name. <laughs> I just used my own name. So Darren Batchelder's uh, multifamily real estate investing show. Um, I got involved about four years ago. So I was a business owner, uh, started a business back in 2007. I've been in the loan trading business. I still have that business um, since 2002, trading large loan portfolios, multifamily, commercial real estate loans, and uh, single family. Whoa, loan trading. Guys, we're going to take a detour here. What is loan trading? This is so Uh, so, interesting. So it's, it's not dealing with the actual individual um, borrower. It's, it's bank to bank. So one bank wants to sell a portfolio of loans. And then I find another bank that wants to buy the loans and, and they have different reasons for doing that. So, um, you know, the bank that is wanting to sell a lot of times, you know, it's, it's capital constrained, right? So they, they're very good at originating loans, but they, you know, they need the capital to be able to originate the next loan. So they sell some of that and they sell it at a gain. So they book a gain, a profit. And then the bank that is buying is typically a bank that's very good at raising deposits. So people that are coming into their bank and putting in deposits, but they can't make enough loans in their market themselves. So they supplement that by buying other loans. Wow. And then I guess they earn out with the interest from the note and they service the debt. That's fascinating. I have no idea how one gets into that, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty niche those business. Transactions. Those are big transactions though, man. Like, I mean, what you're doing would take like a loan officer, I don't know, a whole year to do. You can do that in one transaction. It sounds like. Well, you know, it, it, it all depends on the the type of loans that are being traded and, and, um, but it, you know, it's good for both parties. It's a win-win because, um, they're trying to offload a bunch of loans at one time, you know, with one transaction and the buying bank is looking to, you know, put on a bunch of assets, earning assets, um, you know, that will match fund against their deposits. Wow. Okay. And so one of the, Another way I would tell people is on a residential loan, if you've ever had a mortgage statement, you're paying XYZ bank, and then all of a sudden you get a letter saying, hey, now don't send your payment to XYZ bank, send it to ABC bank going forward. If that's ever happened to you, there's a salesperson behind the scenes that traded a big portfolio of loans and don't take it personally. It's 
it's a good loan. It's just, you know, different needs for different businesses. Yeah. Your loan got sold. But one of the underlying assets that you said were where those loans were made against was multifamily. And so is that how you right. got interested in the business? Yeah. So, um, so I was doing it for, for a long time and, and I had a lot of banks that were like, you know, I love multifamily loans. They just perform very well. Um, you know, even in a down economy, people are paying their rent because, you know, if, if they're going to cut anything out, they're going to cut out entertainment. They're going to cut out, but they need a roof over their head. So, um, multifamily loans have performed very well in both good economies and also, um, you know, in downturns. Wow. Okay. So solid asset class, you have seen that because the debt was still being serviced, even if we had a down economy and that led you to just go out and buy your first building, all cash, no contingencies. <laughs> or what happened? How'd you get into your first deal? But, well, it wasn't exactly like that. Um, so it's funny because I, I wish I had started, you know, earlier, um, but I didn't. I got involved about four years ago. I'm 51, so I was, what, 47. Um, and I had the capital, but I, I fell into the trap of most people, you know, climb the corporate ladder, put, you know, money into the, into the stock market, into 401ks and, um, you know, IRAs and et cetera. And uh I finally said, you know what, I'm going to figure out how to buy real estate. And uh, for me, I went out and bought a, my wife and I bought a new construction duplex uh, first. And that was kind of what I could get my head around. And I had plenty of capital to do it, but I was still scared, man. Um, it was something new. And, um, but once I signed that contract and it was going to take a year to build, once I signed that contract, that was October of 2017, I just knew, look, this is going to take forever to really build wealth, you know, duplex, fourplex, eightplex. So I was like, I want to go bigger. So I went looking for a way to go bigger and I went to a bunch of RIAs and they were focused on single family fix and flips. And I didn't really want to do that. And, and then one Saturday, I finally found a, a group that was focused on multifamily. There was only probably 20 or 30 people there and um, met some people that were part of a multifamily mentorship group. And they were kind enough to spend some time with me. And I was like, look, if they can do it, I can do it. And, you know, I joined and that's all she wrote. Now wow. I'm invested in, I, you know, over a dozen deals and over 4,000 units, you know, both as an LP, KP and GP. Whoa. <laughs> How many duplexes would you have had to buy to do that? Yeah, Holy yeah smoke, a, a lot, a lot. And, you know, it, funny question, duplex versus like the larger deals, you know, people have asked me like, Hey, which one do you like better? The duplex? Cause I still have the duplex, the duplex or the larger deal. I'm like, well, here's a story for you. You know, with the duplex, you know, we, we closed on it and immediately filled up the two units, you know, right away. I hired a third party property management company to manage it. And it was for the first year, it was pretty much like, I didn't have to do anything. It just, I just got the money ACH into my account and, you know, I had to pay the annual property taxes and that was pretty much it. Um, but then after the first year, this is what happened. One of the tenants had saved up enough money to buy their own house and they moved out. Okay. And now it was, I think it was kind of like the end of October. And so now it wasn't prime leasing season. And so the, that unit was vacant November, December, January, and May, I think just January, maybe, maybe into February for me, like I had, it didn't change my lifestyle, you know, like, um, having to front that and not have as much income coming in, but for a lot of people that would crush them, you know, having 50% of that income you know, all of a sudden gone, you know, a lot of people when they buy small to medium size, you know, investments like multifamily, they're counting on that income. So, you know, fast forward to my first syndication deal, 76 units, I would have to have 38 units vacant to be 50% occupied, you know? So it's, um, and the other thing is that everybody looks at single family and multifamily through, um, 
a single family and like duplexes through a lens of like perfection. Okay, well, hey, if I have this single family or I have this duplex, well, both units are rented all year long. Here's my total income. Here are all my expenses. Here's my positive cash flow. But you, most people don't factor in occupancy and then, you know, other expenses related to that. Well, when you buy large deals, that is built into the numbers. So you're already, we always have some units that are vacant, but we've built in like a 10%, you know, occupancy in our business plan. And so if we're above that, then that's just gravy, but we're not going to build the, the base case, you know, assuming that we're hundred percent occupied. I was talking about that last night. I got invited to speak at a meetup and I gave them the case study on how people think they're making money in single family and they're actually losing. And we're not talking about the depreciation, like they're actually losing money. And so I, I can't agree with you more on that point. Yeah. So, you can get lucky, right? I mean, if you get a single family house and you have the same renter for seven years, you know, you're probably doing okay. Right. You know, but if you have turnover, watch out. Got to have the turn cost baked in and that's, uh, that can get really expensive depending on how rough they were in your property. So you mentioned the first deal was 76 units. That deal went perfectly, right? It was fully occupied the whole time. You made money <laughs> hand over fence. You doubled the value of the property in the first year, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Everything doesn't go in a straight line all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely some lessons learned on that first syndication. Um, but I, I, one, one thing I could tell you is compared to, you know, investing in the stock market, my experience is that there's so much more wealth building opportunity in real estate because of leverage, because of the tax efficiency. Um, it just, it just blows the, you know, the returns out of the water compared to what I was getting in the stock market. Now, look, I'm sure there's other people that have invested in the stock market that have killed it. Um, but, you know, if, if I'm going to look at my experience, um, the wealth building opportunity in real estate is just phenomenal. Outstanding. So tell me about the 76 unit. How'd you find it? What happened? So, Did you learn anything? Yeah. So the, um, I had a number of people ask me, you know, after, after getting my, you know, the first deal, um, uh, Darren, Hey man, it took you about nine months to, to be awarded. And then a few more months to close it. So a year, you know, would you do anything differently now looking back on that year of trying to get your first deal? And so these are people that are, you know, new in, in the multifamily mentorship group or people that reach out on social media. And I'm like, absolutely. I wish that somebody had told me this, but I would have um, taken a different strategy, a different approach to working with brokers. So my approach was I'm going to underwrite deals. And then only if I get a deal that really looks strong, then I think that I have a chance to win it am I going to go out on a property tour? Okay. And so, you know, if it, that delayed the amount of time for me to meet many of the brokers in the industry. So what happened was, um, you know, I went out on a deal and I lost the deal, but built a reputation, uh, a relationship with the broker who called me on the next opportunity that I ended up winning. Now, he never would have called me had I not gone out on the prior property tour. So this is, the, this is what I would tell new people is, hey, look, if you're fully committed and you're getting into this game, I would look at, okay, who are the top eight brokerage companies in your market? And then I would break it out for the next two months and say, all right, brokerage company number one, you know, find a deal that they're offering go on a property tour week two, go with a different uh, brokerage company week three, week four, do that for eight weeks. That way you have eight brokerage, eight brokers that go back to, and they, they have lunch with all the other brokers in the office and they say, Hey man, I just went out with Jerome and he's a good guy and he's looking for this. If you guys find something, you know, let me know. I'll get him on, on the line. Now you all of a sudden have all these other people working for you. So when you go on that property tour, there's a number of things that happen. One, 
broker sizing you up? You know, can this guy close? You know, is this guy for real? Is he committed? You know, um, you're doing the same thing. Is this a broker I want to work with? You know, do I trust this guy? You know, is he solid? And, you know, in addition, you're learning by walking the property. You're asking the broker, hey, where do you see the value in this deal? So there's a lot of lessons that can be learned. And then there's a lot of now after two months, you have all these brokers looking for you. A lot of people want to be profitable multifamily operators, but lack the knowledge, deal flow, experience, and capital to be successful. They often try to overcome these challenges out of order, slowing or eliminating their ability to get their next deal done. We've developed a framework that allows them to gain the knowledge they need to find profitable deals. When they do, they create the time and location for you, as well as the generational wealth they desire for their family. The Myers methods of multifamily investing have proved to be the fastest way to establish credibility and properly grow an apartment portfolio. If you want to know more about our four-step process, jump over to MyersMethods.com to get our free four-step guide to getting into multifamily investing. Let's get back to the episode. So getting them on your side and thinking about you when the deal comes up and actually getting face to face instead of saying, hey, send me this kind of deal. That yeah. all would make a big impact on the relationship. Absolutely. Wow. OK, so now that we got brokers looking for us and looking at deals for us, thinking about us when things come up, is that it? Deal flow problem solved or is there some other things that we should we can take away from this 76 unit property? Um, yeah, I mean, no, it's not like, uh, that's it, but that, that definitely helps. I mean, having, you know, in, in the, I, I could speak for the Dallas area, you know, the top, I say the top six, eight brokerage houses, they probably control 80% of the, of the market for large multifamily. And I would consider large multifamily, anything's kind of 60 units and greater. Um, so if you have, you know, though 80% of the market that knows you, you know, and knows what you're looking for, that's definitely going to help your case the earlier that they know. Because when I look back on it, there were, there were brokerage companies that didn't know who Darren Batchelder was, didn't know what I was looking for, you know, didn't know who I was aligned with, didn't know I was part of a multifamily mentorship group. You know, all those things um, are important for the brokerage community to know. And um, so the earlier they know that, the the better you, you may have missed opportunities. Yeah. Happy hunting, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. All right. So build the relationship with the broker. Once you got into the deal, did you pick up anything there? I mean, did yeah. So, you know, again, being part of the mentorship group, um, I had a lot of other syndicators who were like, all right, Darren, man, once you close your, your occupancy is going to drop. No um, way. Yeah. I'm like, no way. Not, not, not our property, you know, like our property is not going to drop. Like th maybe that happens with you guys, but not, not with us. Well, sure enough, all of a sudden it was like, boom, like all these people are gone and it happens for a few different reasons. One, um, you know, there's some tenants that are in properties and they know they're paying below market rate. Um, but they're and they're not, you know, in the nicest property, but they, that's what they want. They want to just save as much of money as possible and pay the least amount. Once the a new owner comes in, they know they're going to be putting money into it. They're going to be raising rents. So they're, they're like, I'm out of here. I'm going someplace else. I'm going to save money down the road. Um, the other thing is that some people are just like, all right, well, I'm not, you know, there's a new sheriff in town and you know, I'm, I'm always late on my payments and they're just going to be, I know they're going to be all over me and I don't want to deal with it, you know, so I'm, I'm out. Um, and it, regardless of the reasons, a lot of times people fall out. Uh, another possible reason is that the seller, you know, the seller knows that the buyer needs to have occupancy in the, in the nineties, you know, in order to get their financing. So if their occupancy starts to drop, they just fill it with whoever during the, during the time of the contract purchase and sale, which is, you know, 60 to 90 days. Um, so those people could, could end up falling out. In any event, we did have a lot of people that, that dropped. And um, 
I wasn't expecting it. And I was like, holy cow, we have one maintenance person on, st- on site, one leasing person. There's no way that leasing per- the maintenance person can upgrade all these units at once. So, you know, thankfully we were working with a, a large property management company that managed over 10 or 20,000 units. Um, and so when we called the, the uh, property management company, they are, had already seen this, right? So they're like, no problem. We're going to bring over three or four guys from other properties. And then they spent a week or two and they banged out and upgraded those units. And then the leasing staff was great and they leased them up. And at the end of the day, it ended up being a good thing for us because now all of a sudden where I thought we were only going to renovate, you know, two or three units per month, all of a sudden we had eight or 10 units that were, you know, upgraded and leased like that. And that, so now we had higher income on those units all the way through the year, but there was like two or three weeks where I was a little nervous. A little? Yeah, I was a little (laughs) nervous for sure. Absolutely. You're so calm. I, I would be panicking because when that occupancy dips below, call it 80%, uh, you better get ready, pull your checkbook out and start paying some bills. Yeah, uh, I, it didn't it didn't go back below 80, but I, I think we were in the mid 90s and we dropped into probably the mid 80s. But still, it was it was still scary. I didn't know if it was going to keep going or if we were going to be able to turn it around. And, you know, when it's your first time, you don't know sure. what to expect. And so um, and, you, you know, you just had a bunch of investors trust you and, you know, invest in your deal. And um, so all of that weighs in on you. Yeah, that's, that's, it's common. It's happened in every property. I, I call it the, you know, who's going to stay, who's going to go and who's going to squat. Cause some <laughs> of the folks squat, they don't leave. They just sit there and don't pay rent. Cause they know, Hey, the new people they are going to try to work with us. And so I can might get a month here and then I'll get a month there. And then when they finally file for eviction, you know, it might be three or four months to the good and then they leave. But anyway, we won't talk about those folks because that's not the majority <laughs> of our residents, right? Right. So, all right, you 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 get in, you realize, well, maybe I could have made some more relationships with brokers. You get in, occupancy, occupancy drops. Did you have anything go on when you were doing your value add? Where Was there anything that you would change in sequence or contractor um, scheduling? So, you know, I was aware ahead of time, you know, most people, when you, and then another reason why it was great to be a part of a, a mentorship group is, is being around other people that had two, three, four, five deals under their belt and you can ask them questions. Um, but you know, the common theme is, Hey, do the exterior renovation, you know, right away. So that way people driving by, you know, see that there's work being done. They're like, Hey, they're investing money in the property. You know, let me go check it out. Um, And then they're going to look at the interiors. Well, so I knew that going in, but I don't come from a, you know, a single family fix and flip um, type of of background. I don't come from a rehab background. Um, So, you know, picking colors and figuring out how we're going to paint this property and, you know, took me a long time to, to figure out. I ended up having a lot of different contractors come out to the property. And I was looking at it very much as a relationship business. And I wanted to be very uh, careful on who I selected that I was confident that they were going to stand behind their work. And, um, and then I was comfortable with the color scheme because, you know, once you make that decision, it's a, it's a big number and you can't, you know, it's very difficult. You, it'll hurt the budget in a big way if you have to redo it. Yeah. So I waited, um, uh, you know, I probably didn't make a decision on painting for six to nine months into the, into, um, the, the first year. And, you know, that obvious is not ideal. The ideal is to know what you're going to do ahead of time. And once you close, you're out there painting and, and getting the property turned around. So, um, but that was, that was my preference because I was, you know, everything was on me and I wanted to make sure that, um, I was comfortable with the decision I made. Well, 
once you make that choice, it's really difficult for you not to go back, right? I mean, yeah. sure, you can get them to paint the side of the building or you can get them to paint a building, but that still becomes really costly because you got to prime it, you got to do all this other stuff. So I, I think that's a really strong one. And so one of the things that's been recurring, though, is that all of the issues that came up along the way, you were forewarned because you had people who had a little bit more experience further down the path than you kind of looking over your shoulder and giving you things to watch out for is probably sure. the best way I can characterize it. Do you feel like that was a big part of the reason why you were able to come in and do that large of a deal on your first go around? Or is it do your business background? Like what I see a lot of people come into the space and they think they want to be syndicators, but you know, they've been told they can do it with no money, no capital, no credit. And they're trying to set up this business and they find out that they can't raise as much money as they thought they could. And they're not being taken seriously by brokers. And so, you know, just navigating that, I mean, what, what tips kind of as a final word could you give to our listeners out there? Sure. I, you know, I would highly recommend if you're looking to get into large scale multifamily world to, to join a mentorship group. Um, there's just so many, benefits to it. Um, so the first thing is, is confidence, you know, just being surrounded with other people that have done it. And, you know, look, I, I met so many great people, but at the end of the day, I'm like, they're just people, right? They're people that learned how to do it. And then they took action. So if they can do it, you know, I can do it, you know, so that just being around those types of people is, is huge Two, When you call the broker, you know, credibility, you know, when you call the broker and the broker, you say, Hey, I want to go on this property tour for this hundred unit property. And the broker says, you know, what do you own? And you're like, Oh, I got this great house. You know, I've owned it for the last eight years. No, no, no. What, what multifamily properties you own? Well, this would be my first. And the guys, you know, the guy's most likely going to be cordial to you on the phone, but immediately in the back of his head, he's like, this guy can't close. Right. You're not, you're going to be put in the back. But once you say, Hey, I'm part of this multifamily mentorship group. I just joined it. I can hear, I can hear a click happen because the broker now all of a sudden says, all right, well, Darren may be new, but I've done like 10 deals with people from that group, you know, and they always partner with somebody that has experience. So I have a lot of confidence in that group. And it, so it changes the credibility, even though you don't have a deal, you gain credibility by being part of that group. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big, big, big plus. Third, I don't think you can win a deal in today's market as competitive as, as, as it is without partnering with somebody that has experience. So where do you find that guy to partner with? Well, you find that guy a girl in these multifamily mentorship groups. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Don't go it alone. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of money at risk, not just yours and your reputations at risk as well. Darren, thank you so much for joining me on multifamily missteps. I, we haven't covered the majority of stuff that we talked about here. And so I know I'm better off for it. And the listeners are as well to the listeners, the packs with you. We'll talk soon. You made it to this juncture, so you really love what we shared on this episode of Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Do us a favor, give us a five-star rating, give us a review, and share this with somebody who's interested in multifamily investing. Until the next time, the pack is with you. Ooh.